to use the time we have together with you. And I know that you who are here, you are all busy uh, colleagues. And we will be, uh, be in time to have uh, this one hour webinar. So I would like to welcome all of you very warmly on behalf of Eden. Eden is the European Distance and E-Learning Network. And this webinar is hosted by the Eden Special Interest Group for Technology Enabled Learning and Quality Enhancement and the Eden NAP, the Network of Academic Professionals. So it's a collaboration in between us. <coughs> the title, as you have seen when you register, is about the United Nations UNESCO OER recommendations, the way forward for member countries. And we will discuss that uh, with you and in between us with the presenters during this hour. Uh, this webinar is also um, followed up by an Eden chat this, uh, this evening at uh, 6 o'clock p.m. We always used to do that to have our webinars and chats at the same date so we can discuss further on if there are questions coming up from the webinars. So you're welcome back again at 6 o'clock p.m. with the Eden chat. It is a tweet chat. So very quick and efficient. Uh, my name is uh, Ebba Ostja Nilsson. I'm a professor in innovative and open online learning. And I am in the Eden EC and also in the ICD EC. And I am uh, also the chair of this uh, special interest group about uh, technology enhanced uh, learning and quality. And I'm also with ICDE, uh, sharing the ICD Advocacy OER Committee. <laughs> we have today um, a very uh, interesting, inter interesting and uh, knowledgeable uh, panel uh, for this webinar. It is um, uh, Professor Roy McGreal from Athabasca University. He is also the UNESCO ICDE Chair in OER and co-editor for EROL at Athabasca University. We have Yenrin Westler, who is from Creative Commons, and she is also in the ICD OER Advocacy Committee, which I previously mentioned. We have uh, Dr. Andrea Inaborato dos Santos from the Joint Research Center. <laughs> And I think very many of you know her from her work uh, uh, with colleagues about the uh, Open Educational Framework. We have uh, Dr. Sandra Christina Softik from the University of Zagreb University Computing Center, and she is also the EDEM president. And then we have myself, um, which I previously presented. I will do the first introduction, and I will also moderate this session. So a warm welcome to all of you. Um, <clears throat> you are joining in now. We have just started this webinar about the UN UNESCO OER recommendations, the way forward for member countries. And please write your name and also the map in uh, right where you are coming from. And you can, during the whole webinar, write questions or comments or links or whatever in the chat. And I will try to keep an eye on that um, during the, this hour to follow up uh, things and to follow up with the presenters. So please just uh, feel free to write and to collaborate uh, during this uh, webinar. It's very important. We who are presenters, we maybe know something uh, about this, and we do, because we have followed this process for a very long time, very, very many years, as it has gone on. And, um, but you have all the questions, and we have also a lot of questions ourselves. So let's start. Hello, Stephen Downs. Good to see you. <laughs> so first, some uh, slides about Eden. Eden is the largest active and developing professional community of research and practitioners of open distance and e-learning in Europe. <laughs> and it was established already in 1991. And it's a platform for professional cooperation and information exchange. <clears throat> um, we are currently registered in UK, but as you know, the situation is UK. We have uh, another plan for that after the Brexit, so we have to also update this slide. We, but we are an open, uh, we're open for institutions, individuals, and networks, and we work at all levels and sectors of the, uh, the educational uh, 
training sector. The mission is about uh, support and levels to modernize education in Europe, network and collaborate, facilitate knowledge and practice exchange, improve understanding amongst professionals in distance e and e-learning, and to promote, promote policy and practice uh, across Europe. And as I mentioned, we have the special interest group, and we also have the Eden uh, NAP for Network for Academic Professionals. We organize conferences. The next conference it will be in Romania in June. We have annual conferences. Um, and we also have uh, open classrooms. We have uh, research uh, workshops. And um, we have a very uh, informative web page, which you're welcome to have a look at. Our members are both from institutions, individuals, and networks. We have around uh, almost 200 institutional members and some 1,100 plus members in NAP. And Eden NAP are organizing webinars and chats uh, each month, and this is the first for this year. There's a second coming up on the 12th of February. Uh, we have some 30 European and national networks presenting in, uh, present in membership and some 400 plus institutions represented from 70 countries within the outside, within and outside of Europe. <clears throat> I know that Sandra, the president of Eden, will also maybe say something more uh, in the end of the webinar about Eden and the way forward. So let's get, let's get started. Um, those uh, uh, OER, UNESCO, uh, United Nations UNESCO OER uh, recommendations was adopted the 25th of November in 2019, uh, last autumn. So it was a very, very long process and a rather hard process to get it adopted from over 190 countries around the world. So now it is not just time for uh, awareness raising about OER, but for implementation and about monitoring and evaluation, and to really implement recommendations within and into the member countries. And we all have a responsibility for that as individuals, as institutions, as countries, as authorities, and the, every step, step we are taking will make a difference. And there are a lot to do about that. The, the five areas which the, the overall recommendations concern on is about building capacity of stakeholders to create access, reuse, adapt, and redistribute OER. And as we all know that OER is the open education resources. And the definition of OER has somewhat been uh, redefined since those uh, recommendations was taken in November. The second one is about developing supportive policies in member states. Uh, in institutions, in countries, at different kind of levels. Encouraging uh, inclusive and equitable quality OER, and that is of course in align with the uh, uh, sustainability development goals. It is about nurturing the creation of sustainability models for OER, and about facilitating international cooperation. In fact, the fifth one about international cooperation have an influence and impact on all the other fours. four. So that is actually not a separate one because it has an impact on all the, the previous fours. So um, those recommendations is also about monitoring and evaluation. So member states also have to monitor and evaluate in a very, um, um, how to say, a very um, videos and a comprehensive way, and there are guidelines for that, how to do it. For example, deploying appropriate research mechanisms to measure the effectiveness and effect, uh, efficiency of OER policies, and incentives against defined, uh, the defined objectives, about collecting and disseminating progress and good practices, innovation and research reports, and also about developing strategies to monitor, monitor uh, the educational effectiveness and long-term financial efficiency, efficiency of OER. And that is, of course, on a bit different levels, at the individual levels, at the institutional level, at country level, and what uh, kind of difference it, it will make. 
And such a strategy could focus on improving learning processes and strengthening the connections between findings, decision making, transparency, and accountability to inclusive and equitable quality education and research. And again, you can see that this is very much aligned with the STGs. And this process has been very, very long, uh, not at least for the four last years. There's been several consultations, several conferences, several declarations coming up to this. So it is a very, very important step forward for opening up education. And with that, I will leave the floor to the other presenters to give their reflections and comments and thoughts about uh, <clears throat> those recommendations and its impact. And I will start with Yandere Wessler from Creative Commons, who also is, uh, oh, sorry, sorry. <laughs> I will start with Rory McReed, of course, who is the uh, ICDE uh, OER uh, UNESCO here. And I will start to, to give the floor to you, Rory. And you have a very, very long experience, and you have been uh, very, very much involved in uh, the development coming so far with the OER recommendations. So the floor is yours, uh, Rory. Do you want me to start, Emma? Yes, please. Oh, OK. Um, well, good afternoon or good morning, depending on uh, where you are. Um, it is a bit difficult to hear your voice. Can you maybe talk closer to the mic okay. or adjust you your volume? Now. Is that better? Yes. OK. Um, I'd uh, um, uh, like to uh, um, put, put to people that we are all um, uh, responsible uh, for implementing Strategic Development Goal 4 of UNESCO, which is education for all. And open educational resources have been identified by UNESCO as being uh, one of the tools or one of the applications that we can use uh, that will promote uh, education for all. And uh, um, I believe that open education resources are essential for this. I don't, uh, many people think that uh, open educational resources are good things to have and isn't it wonderful and it, it promotes this, that and the other thing. And I believe it's even more important than that, it, that they are essential. And I believe this for two reasons. One is because of digital rights management. And the second one is because of the digital licenses that is put on commercial content. So commercial content um, is generally strapped and it has, that comes with it, are applications um, that stop you from doing what you want to do with your device. They deliberately uh, designed for defectiveness, to make your device incapable of being used the way you want it. <clears throat> And this is called digital rights management. And uh, I prefer to use the term digital restrictions management uh, because it restricts you from using your device the way you want. So if you have commercial content, uh, they put this digital rights management uh, software in and it affects your operating system. And uh, it can be, um, it, it it, it can be so bad that it destroys your, your operating system, and it has done so in a number of occasions in the past. Uh, digital rights management software needs deep permissions into the operating system, and it can stop your normal operating uh, system functions. So what it does is when you get used commercial educational content, is they limit you. So you can't copy or paste, you can't text to speech, you can't change the format, uh, you can't move material from one computer to another, you can't print it out. If you move geographically, let's say from Europe to America, you can't use the content that you purchased in Europe and America. Um, it usually has educational content uh, 
commercial content usually has an expiry date where they come in and just take it off your computer. And uh, it has so many bad features um, that I'm suggesting uh, that the, this commercial content we must avoid at all costs and we must move uh, to open educational uh, um, uh, open educational resources. Um, they claim that their application, along with their DRM, is their uh, intellectual property. But really, our devices are our property. And their digital rights management restricts our freedom to use our property the way we wish to use it. And it brings up this question. Can we not own and control our own property? Um, this is a very serious issue that's uh, uh, coming up where they, they uh, deliberately disable our computers in the way they want um, without us having done any offense. Uh, we can be totally uh, innocent. And uh, um, they have even, in, in some cases, uh, uh, tried to put in uh, poison pills that will actually destroy the operating system of a, uh, of a computer. And they've tried to bring it in with the legislation. And uh, if anyone has heard of error 53 on an Apple computer, uh, an iPad or an iPhone, um, uh, beware because it destroys your operating system, and it does that um, if you go to an unauthorized Apple dealer. Um, uh, this happened a few years ago, and I do believe that Apple has corrected that. And they, they don't do that anymore, but uh, we don't know what else uh, they're going to do or what, they're, uh, what they are capable of. Now, all of this is not going to be a, 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 a problem um, because uh, if we could just uh, change it, because uh, really anyone can break these systems. Uh, no matter what digital rights management they put in, uh, it can be broken. But what they've done then is reinforce digital rights management with digital licenses, where when you click on I agree, most people don't even know, and most people have never read the licenses that they've agreed to. Uh, but some of the things in those licenses are like, uh, for example, you've agreed that the owners have no liability for their application, even if it doesn't work. Uh, you've agreed that they can invade your computer without permission. You've agreed that they can collect and use your personal data. You've agreed that the user has a privilege to use the product, not own it. You don't own your own product uh, that you bought, uh, that you're prohibited, and this is a really uh, nefarious one for education, you're prohibited to show your content to anyone else. Can you imagine students in study groups and they're not allowed to show their screens to other students? And you must accept that you have no rights. So when you click I agree, you've agreed that you have no fair dealing or fair use rights. So they're very nefarious. And it shows uh, that they want to have full control over you and what you do uh, with your computer. The only solution I believe is that we just bypass this system, that we do not use commercial content in education, and that we move to open educational resources. And that way, we can copy paste, we can text to speech, uh, we maintain our rights, our digital privacy, we can move things, print them out, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So uh, I strongly uh, uh, suggest that we must have open educational resources. We've entered this new world um, where you buy but you don't get. You remember? The world we used to live in where you bought something, you owned it. Well, now you buy it, you buy your uh, electronic textbook, but you don't own it, you don't get it. You only have the right to use it under their conditions. So it's a new 
world uh, that we've entered. And uh, um, I think that uh, we as educators need to bypass it and use open educational resources. Um, I'll, uh, I'll finish with that. Uh, yes, uh, thank you. Thank you very much for um, your very wise and very uh, um, uh, comprehensive reflections on this. It's very important to think about. Um, if you are um, attending this webinar, uh, please feel free to um, uh, write your comments or questions in the chat. And for your information, this webinar is also recorded, so you can um, you can use it afterwards. You can go back to it, and you can also share it with your colleagues and friends. Uh, it will be found at the webpage for Eden for this webinar. So now I will um, continue to give the floor to uh, Jenrin Wetzler from uh, Creative Commons, and Jenrin is also uh, an advocate for the Advocacy Committee by ICDE. Thank you. The so floor much. is yours, uh, Jenrin. Can hear me? Great. So first, yes. it's a pleasure to be here, and I, I feel very honored to be part of the, the presentation. Um, I wanted to give a quick um, overview of what we at Creative Commons are doing to, um, to address the UNESCO OER recommendation and support countries in, in their work to address the, the action areas. But first, um, Creative Commons, for those of you who may not be familiar with us, um, is a, uh, a global nonprofit organization that has built and now stewards the legal tools and licenses that, um, that kind of undergird open educational resources and that are used to power um, movements around the world in education, in um, science, in open policy, and more. So um, we are delighted to find that I think there are over 1.6 billion licensed works online currently, and those span 9 million websites. We also um, we work in um, a lot of different um, policy domains and in training. So we're very eager to draw on um, some of our programs to help countries implement the UNESCO OER recommendation. And I, I couldn't agree more with Rory for his his um, passion about using and harnessing the power of open educational resources to really further sharing, not just leasing access to information, but helping people have um, and own resources, to share resources and be able to um, build on them together. So um, our main mission is, is about sharing. Um, before, I, before I get into some of the details, I did want to note that um, we are currently at the very early stages of our work for addressing the UNESCO OER recommendation, and we are um, we are working, or we will be working in partnership with the UNESCO Dynamic Coalition of Countries and NGOs that will be addressing um, the recommendation and helping other countries um, do so as well. Um, there's also a um, a network of NGOs that will be helping the Dynamic Coalition and will be helping countries. Um, with their work as well. So there are, there are a lot of activities um, in play and that are just starting. They're at the nascent stages of support. So I just want to note that because we are at the very beginning of this, um, some of the information that I provide today may not be final. And also, um, I am not um, speaking on behalf of any of our partners or, or the coalition right now. I just want to make it clear that um, the, the commitments that I'm sharing today are um, ones that Creative Commons is, is ready to, to work on or is already working on. Okay, so the first thing that we're, we're doing is um, looking at ways that we can better understand country context um, and work with colleagues on research around the constraints and areas of opportunity to accomplish OER recommendation objectives. So I, I actually want to save a little bit of time um, in this presentation to um, return to this so we can actually brainstorm together um, some of these areas of opportunity. Mm. The second area that we're working on is the capacity building. So Creative Commons has a CC certificate training, and I will post the link to that in the chat space. This is actually something that um, I have the pleasure of managing 
it's an online or in-person training on um, international um, copyright, open licenses, and best practices for using and um, kind of updating open educational resources to best suit one's own needs in one's institution, and then also um, opening further avenues for sharing within one's institution. So we're looking at ways that we can train people in capacity for open licensing and also strengthen their, their capacity as advocates. Um, so one thing that we're doing with this training to best support the UNESCO OER recommendation is offer um, countries that are interested in upskilling a number of their, their counterparts um, discounts for bulk purchases on this training. And we also provide all of the, the resources for this training as open licensed educational resources, obviously, on our website. So please feel free to look at our website. You can download those resources and um, help share them with people who might be interested in building capacity as well. Um, third, we also um, we've worked with a number of um, national governments in the past and civil society stakeholders to create, adopt, and implement open licensing policies to ensure that publicly funded educational and research resources are open licensed or dedicated to the public domain. So this is to say we want to make sure that resources that the public funds through taxes are still available to the public after they are created. Um, we might create some um, open policy templates or open education policy examples, um, policy briefs, rationales, handouts, slides, talking points, and data to support advocacy and awareness building activities in these domains to encourage the open licensing policy support. And I know um, before my time, Creative Commons has done a lot of work with, um, with a number of different US government agencies um, to, to really empower these efforts. And actually, when I formerly worked at the US Department of State, I had the pleasure of working with Creative Commons on some of these, um, these policies, which were um, really helpful to um, the State Department at the time. But other policies um, have been implemented at the US Department of Education, US aid, and, and so on. Um, so we anticipate being able to adapt some of these policies to meet the, the different needs and contexts of other countries looking to implement open education policies. We certainly don't want to apply a, a one-size-fits-all with the, the policy templates, but we do anticipate being able to help people with um, the kind of resources and support that would best help them implement, um, create, adopt, and implement these policies. OK, so I wanted to return to um, our first area of, of action, which is the research. And actually use this time, I know we have a short amount of time together, but I wanted to use this as a chance to hear from you. I wanted to um, pose a question to us so we could use a couple minutes here to brainstorm how we might um, look at related goals and related advocacy efforts that can provide some mutual support. So what I want to ask you today is, where are there established international efforts whose goals may be different, but that can support our work in OER? And similarly, where our work addressing the UNESCO OER recommendation can support them meeting their goals. So what we're doing is looking for kind of a win-win a scenario where um, we find kind of synergies between seemingly different efforts. Um, and to start this, I actually I created a kind of like a template list for this webinar. And I will put this the link in this chat space right here. So what I'm doing is highlighting how we will start to think about the, the different areas of opportunity with other, other partnerships or other efforts that might have different goals, but that um, might provide kind of mutual support for us. So if you click on the, the link, you will see I've listed already 
the open government partnership as an easy example of this, and I'm happy to talk about that a little bit more. I've also listed um, just looking at some of the efforts that are currently underway to address SDG 4, um, because I know there are a number of different NGOs addressing SDG 4, some of them through the lens of OER. Um, but there are, there are numerous other efforts that we might be able to list, including perhaps um, ICDE's OER Advocacy Committee, which Ava had mentioned, or um, a, there are a number of others. So in the next couple moments, I just want to make sure you are aware of what, what fields you might fill in if and when you have time. And I will also just, um, in case it helps, walk through the first example of the Open Government Partnership, just to give you a sense of the kind of um, potential synergy that we might be able to find. So please feel free to add to this list whenever you um, think of something. I will be adding to this list in the, in the near future as well. OK, so if we look at the Open Government Partnership example, currently the Open Government Partnership is a, essentially a pact among 78 countries around the world that have committed to transparency and governance or increasing transparency actions that have committed to um, more engagement with civil society, more um, fiscal transparency and efficiency, and so on. So their, their areas of focus lend themselves to OER efforts. And in fact, there have been a number of countries that have applied OER or committed to OER actions to meet the goals of the Open Government Partnership already. Um, I know because I was, um, I was working with some of the commitments when I was in my former job. So it's, it's a really wonderful avenue for us to explore. I think you can see a list of at least eight countries with um, OER commitments on the Spark Open page, which is linked in um, column C. But there are a number of other countries that are not listed there. There are more than eight countries that have um, worked with open education to achieve their own um, goals in their national action plans. So just really quickly, a couple areas of synergy that um, we might consider for this. We can, where there, are, um, where there are open government partnership countries that are on the verge of making new commitments, we can highlight for them that their work addressing the UNESCO OER recommendation would be an easy commitment to make for the Open Government Partnership. Essentially, they could get credit for their, what work they're planning on doing for UNESCO in the Open Government Partnership, and it would be a very easy lift. This would also build on our momentum. So it, it would be an easy lift for them. It would also kind of strengthen some of the, um, the efforts that we are undertaking already. Um, we might also well, I think we have to yeah. stop here, Jan, Jan Ruin. Uh, thank you, thank you very much. Um, and I think this uh, document which you have created and shared with us is uh, very important. And I think we all shall take a look at it and uh, see how we can contribute. Uh, because as both you has um, uh, emphasized, and also Roy, and also actually myself, we all have to be we are all responsible for how this process yeah. will come forward. Now we can't. Now we have the recommendations, and now we have to implement them and to monitor them and to do as much as we can because this is a unique milestone in the open education uh, area, I will say. So with that, uh, it is natural for me to leave the floor to Andrea uh, in Amorata de Santos, who is coming from the URC. And, um, you have, uh, some years ago, actually in 2016, you and your colleagues, and for me, you have seen that you uh, launched a very fantastic, useful report about uh, the framework work for open education, where OER is uh, one part, of course. And you're also stressing that OER is not just the resources, but it's the whole, uh, you need to have the whole framework. So I will leave the floor to you, Andrea. 
Thank you, Eva. Um, hello, everybody. Uh, good afternoon, good morning, depending on where you are. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, uh, I think that most of you uh, know the framework Eva is talking about because we've launched it in 2016, as she mentioned, the, the open education framework with the 10 dimensions of open education. But a lot of work has been uh, going on at the European Commission since we launched this report. And I will briefly tell you um, what has been done in the state of the art. So I, I, I'm, I'm waiting for my, for my PowerPoint to be uploaded, but in any case, I will start by saying that the, the Joint Research Center is the European Commission, uh, is the research arm of the European Commission, so our main job is to do research involving different stakeholders, not only from European countries, um, but also from abroad. So most of these um, of these frameworks and reports that, are, that I'll briefly mention to you have had many hands collaborating to get them done. Um, I wonder if I can, okay, so this is it. We are the Joint Research Center. We are based here in, in Spain, in Seville, but uh, our focus is mostly on the 27, still 28 member states, no? Okay, so very briefly, I'll briefly mention these two frameworks for you, uh, which have to do with, uh, with uh, OER, uh, the Digital Competence Framework for Educators, I'll mention later on, and the Open Education Framework. Um, it, it's just to, to, to remind everybody that the, perspe the perspective the Commission has always taken on, on OER is to look at it embedded into, um, into a more, uh, let's say, comprehensive way of looking at the use of OER, uh, not only as teaching materials, but also what can be done in terms of research, in terms of technology, uh, in terms of collaboration, and we call this whole area, this whole great area, greater area, open education in general. Um, I wanted to show you, just a second, I think this is, I'm going to share with you uh, okay, I'm sorry. This is a different. This is a. I have too many slides, and I have to, to speed up a little bit. But this is the framework that we have with the ten dimensions for action. Uh, if there is anybody who doesn't know it, you can check online uh, all that we have, and you see that in the content dimension is where we treat everything related to OER. So I think this webinar is about the the UNESCO OER recommendation, which is great, um, and also beyond. And I think that we are talking a little bit about the beyond no, now in terms of the work of the European Commission because we have already done a lot of work in the area of OER and I just wanted to show you where to find them if you are a researcher or an academic in particular looking at implementing uh, some of these ideas on how to go forward with OER in your own institution or in your own school. So OER would be uh, in the content dimension, as I said there, in the center of, uh, of the framework. And then we talk about OER and open education in general in relation to pedagogy, open, ed open pedagogical practices, recognition of open learning, which has to do with open education, mostly based on OER, collaboration between teachers, you know, to share and uh, adapt OER, uh, research, which has to do with open science, um, open research, open data sharing, all these sorts of things related to higher, higher education in particular, opening up access, and everything that has to do with technology, which I think uh, Rory was mentioning in the beginning, no? all the free and open source softwares that need to be used to enhance uh, uh, the sharing of OER, etc. Okay. Can you hear me well? I'm not sure if you can. Yes? Okay, great. Right, so um, I will go straight on and show you. This is the report when you can find everything about this framework, which is already well known. There is a summary in Spanish for anyone who prefers to read a summary in Spanish, which we just published last year. There is a link to it in there. 
But what I want to show you now is the newest report that we launched based on this framework, which was launched last year, which is called Practical Guidelines on Open Education for Academics. So based on that framework, what we did was a kind of checklist for academics, mostly focusing on higher education, but it can be easily adapted to school education, right? Um, to help academics to implement open education. Amongst which practices, we, we will find uh, um, the, the dimension of content related to OER, to open educational resources. So we briefly discuss our understanding of open education, which goes beyond OER, to include MOOCs, to include open recognition of learning, open learning, and everything that I showed you before um, in, the, in the framework. And here is, an, is, is just uh, um, uh, an example of how we deal with the dimensions. No? For example, we have a core dimension, which is pedagogy. So on the left-hand side, we have statements for reflection in which academics can think whether they consider themselves open, educa open educators, whether they would like to become open educators, and what, what is the role of pedagogy no? in terms of being open, how open practices can help them become open educators, and obviously the use of open educational resources is treated in there as well. No, the licensing of content, the sharing of content, the co-creation of content, the publication, adaptation, etc. So we, we treat these practices as open educational practices, OEP. And basically, it's a summary of what we did in the, in the main report, bringing what you can do with simple ideas and the checklist for you to check or for any educator to check whether they are already doing uh, these open practices and what they can do. Another example is the dimension of access. Uh, what does it mean to have access to, to, to free and open content like who we are? What are our responsibilities in terms of uh, how to deal with this content, how to reference this content, so and so forth. So that report is very practical and you can decide to work with all the 10 dimensions or for example you can choose and pick and choose one of the dimensions that you'd like to focus most, um, most in terms of your own classroom or in terms of your institutional policies no? or even um, policies that relate to, to, to a country level, country level policies. Uh, I think this is interesting to, to give an idea of the things that can be done at a local level. This one in particular is related for academics. Um, so just to, to tell you, so for each dimension we have this um, easy, let's say, um, easy to use uh, paper no, that you can take away with you and distribute to, to the teachers of your institution uh, to show them what they can do. We have also the dimension of content, I'm not showing it, but you can find in the report in which we discuss in particular OER. But just to move on and very briefly say to you that we also have the Digital Competence Framework for Educators. GCOMPEDU, which is very well known uh, in Europe and beyond, and we have a tool called Checking Tool, which we use to check the digital competence of, edu or competence of educators. And lately, what we have just done now was to include open education into this tool. This tool is available to everyone. Any, any individual can go into this URL, particularly teachers, because it's focusing on teachers, and check their digital competence, their self-perception, where they think they stand at a digital competence level between A1 and C2 levels. What we did just now was to include a further area which is about open education, so that academics can also test whether they could improve their own open practices. And the interesting thing is that this new, this new uh, uh, tool that we are launching, the tool is already online, but it's going to be launched um, after the pilot, a new, a new technological software with uh, the new questionnaire I'm talking about, with the seventh area, which is about open education. It's going to be launched firstly nationwide, in Spain and then across Europe and we have a lot of countries wanting to participate at a country level to test the digital competence of their teachers. So I think this will help us to disseminate the concept of open education, what can be done in terms of OER for digital materials and also for, for uh, open research. Um, 
in scientific research, and that's our aim, is to embed all this theory that we have, that we develop, and the frameworks that we developed based on our research at the Commission into the tools that can go into practice, let's say, at a member state level, right? So this is just a, a snapshot of the, of the, the areas that uh, this digital competence framework covers, and now there is this uh, new area, which is open education, that we've embedded in the tool. Okay, um, and I just want to finish with this, with this thought of Bernard Shaw, because I think that when we are talking about open education, we've been dealing with it, some of us here, for over a decade, certainly, you know, and we see how, we, how it progresses, it's slowly but always a steady, and this is important, it's important to be reasonable and try new things if we want to make it happen. So I think this OER recommendation is, was a great way forward. And if this joint action comes from, from different parts, from governments, from schools, from individuals, individual academics, individual teachers, we can make it grow even more. So I'll stop here, and I'm open for questions when the time comes. Thank you. Oh, I think what uh, you are working with, and uh, this open education framework has uh, really got a very large dissemination, I think. I think um, quite many are using it, and uh, reflecting on it, and referring to it, at least. So thank you so much. Um, I haven't seen uh, directly any questions in the chat so far, but uh, please feel free to, um, to um, Right questions and yes, uh, the last one was here about to have the powerpoints. Uh, uh, the presentation is recorded and all the powerpoints will be there as well. And this is uh, a document which uh, Yanrin shared with us. So, and I'm also sure that we will have some kind of follow-up uh, uh, events uh, from this webinar because there seems to be a huge interest in the implementation of the OER recommendations. So let's uh, continue uh, the the process and the talks. So I will now leave the floor to um, Dr. Sandra Christina Sotek, who is the president of Eden, and um, to listen to your reflection and to listen to the way forward for Eden. The floor is yours, uh, Sandra. Thank you, Eva. Thank you. Uh, thanks to all presenters uh, before me because I think it's really, really good the way how the present presenters have been uh, chosen. You know, to give an overview, to, to give some uh, creative commons uh, actions and uh, uh, policies uh, uh, working on, and then from GRC to see what's already been done, and uh, uh, coming at the end to the Eden as an organization. So Eden um, has been presented at the beginning by Eva, so I'm not going to talk more about uh, uh, Eden as an uh, organization and such, but I would focus much more on what we are doing already in Eden regarding the openness and open education. Um, I would just say that, uh, as uh, Andrea said, uh, these recommendations have come as really good way forward because lots of uh, things have been done already in the field of open education, open access, OER. And uh, very important things by GRC, European Commission, but also by uh, Creative Commons and other institutions, uh, educational institutions, organizations in Europe and worldwide. And uh, what we can do as an organization, as Eden, uh, in regarding fostering and enhancing the further use of OER and openness uh, in education. So uh, in Eden, we have already been doing some supporting and fostering of open education and building awareness on OER uh, with joining and enhance, enhancing the open education movement and also the contributing to the global movement of Open Education Week. So I'm just going to say the last uh, Open Education Week we contributed with the five slides. You can see the numbers. You can see that uh, we have reached quite a large audience uh, with our uh, uh, webinars and Open Education Week. And I think it's very important that we create the, the communities, the, the networking, to gather people together to join, to discuss, to further get the ideas how they can uh, contribute and be more open. And also, we are preparing already for the uh, fourth Open Education uh, Week in, Euro uh, in Europe. Eden is joining as well. So 
these are the topics which we will present this year during the Open Education Week, uh, the first week in the March. And uh, in that way, we will continue discussion on challenges uh, highlighted by the community regarding the open education. Uh, also, what we do is that our webinars, uh, we produce a number of webinars with aim to um, uh, share with the community the uh, know-how and expertise from the experts. And all our record, uh, webinars are recorded and publicly available. So uh, we, quite, we have quite a large repository already of uh, our webinars. Um, our proceedings from the conferences are published under CC license, so they're open. We have a European Journal of Open Business and E-Learning, uh, which is also uh, talking about the issue of uh, opening, openness. And also Eden is uh, actually participating in EU projects related to the topic of uh, open uh, and open education and open access. So I think that uh, organizations as Eden are important to enable people to get much more information about open education uh, and openness in general and to um, make uh, them aware uh, that we need to be co-creators of everything, of the materials, of, uh, of knowledge, and not just users. And uh, this, is, uh, of, uh, this is one of the roles of the organization such as Eden. So um, to, to make ch this change of the mindset shift toward the openness, and um, also uh, not talking only about education, but as well as research in the research openness and in research, as Jenrin already have been saying, research, publicly funded uh, uh, research and uh, in, uh, innovative projects should be uh, open uh, to everyone. So uh, regarding Eden, we are also having our uh, uh, research workshops where we also talk about openness and open education and open research. And for the end, I would like to announce the, uh, our annual conference in Timisoara, Romania, uh, in June. And you can see the title of the conference, Human and Artificial Intelligence Society of Future. But also, the, the, one of the tracks, uh, several, or several tracks, will be dealing with the issue of open uh, education and OER. So uh, we provide the floor for further discussion uh, in enabling uh, community to build and to grow in awareness of openness and production of OER. So um, I would like to thank all the presenters for, for being able and uh, willing to participate today and to my Eva, my dear colleague uh, working uh, in our special interest group on TEL who has uh, a lot of uh, energy and uh, find the effort to organize this. Uh, thank you so much um, uh, Sandra. Um, very good. Um, so, um, Eden Secretary, can I have my presentation back? Thank you. Uh, so, thank you very much to all the presenters uh, for your fruitful insights and um, also expressing what you are uh, doing within the, the different organiz uh, organizations and for your insights. Um, I would like to uh, stress that what UNESCO is very much uh, emphasizing and promoting with this uh, dynamic uh, coalition which uh, was mentioned by Yenrin for example uh, from all the, the it, it comprises of all the member states and they are really trying to focus on those five five um, areas of actions. I mean, there's a lot of things doing, but it will also be very good if uh, each of us who are working with the implementation and the monitoring, if we also can relate it to those actions, because then it will be easier and more visible uh, to really see what is happening around the globe with the OER recommendations, which really, really are a milestone in the area of open education. And all of us who are believers and who are working in this area, we can all make a difference um, in our actions, in, in, within our actions, in our mindset, where, as Sandra was mentioned, and what each of our organizations are, are working on. 
uh, this webinar is recorded and um, all uh, presentations will be available. So please use it, please share it. And it was also suggested by uh, Stephen Downs in the chat to share to share it in the email list of open education and open education resources for those who couldn't uh, attend us for today. Um, there is a lot of activities going on, and as, and as you saw from Sandra's presentation, there's a lot of work uh, with Eden uh, throughout the, the coming um, events we are we are hosting and what we are working with on this area, and I'm sure a lot more will come. Um, so with that, I will thank you all uh, participants for today, and I would like to thank all the presenters for being here with us today and sharing your insights um, and fruitful uh, thoughts about um, how we can make the way forward and how we, with our different organizations, both can work within our organizations, but also work together with each other, because that is also needed. And you who are coming from universities, uh, organizations, educational settings, or whatever, you have a huge role to, to play as well. As uh, uh, We need to work on both micro-level, meso-level, and macro-level, and each of us can make a difference. Uh, we have um, an upcoming webinar uh, again next month, and that is the 12th of February, and that will be about promoting open online learning in the workforce in Europe, a very interesting initiative from the European Commission. And there is also a lot of work about um, OER and about open education, so please join if you have the possibilities. It is already announced at the uh, Eden webpage. Uh, let me see if there are any more comments here in the end. Um, it seems that uh, it seems to me at least that you have been uh, taking part in this webinar, have found found it um, uh, fruitful and uh, and uh, useful, and uh, there's a lot of thanks to each of the presenters. Um, and I will again thank you all, all of you who have taken part in this webinar, the presenters and the participants. Uh, a lot for, for joining us in this very, very important milestone in the way of opening up education to reach the SDG goals and to uh, work for the future of education, learning for all and learning to become, which is the new initiative from UNESCO, learning to become. So I think we are more or less in time. It's a uh, uh, for 30 years, perhaps it's 30. So um, by that, uh, thank you very much. And uh, please uh, stay connected with this uh, last slide. I put also the link uh, here with Eden. That is the, <coughs> the link for the Eden uh, webpage. So um, please be connected and uh, stay in touch. So thank you very much, all of you.